as I was so kindly introduced, uh, I'm Dr. Franklin Annis. Uh, doctor isn't usually the title that I normally use. Uh, I have the academic credentials. I have a doctorate of education, um, which I focus on self-directed learning for military. It's what I'm kind of best known for or most widely published for. I am a U.S. Army historian as well, and I'm internationally published. If anyone wants to uh, kind of go look up some of my other research, you can uh, explore my ORCID. And to keep my employer happy, I have to say that the, the research that you'll see presented today is entirely my opinion and probably far too advanced to be any institutional belief. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is, how does a uh, professor that focuses on uh, adult education theory get interested in Stoic philosophy, at least for the military? And it happened because I focused a lot of my research on a guy named Captain Alden Partridge, which was probably America's greatest educational philosopher. Um, however, most people don't know who he is, and it's a tragedy, but I'm currently writing a book about him, hopefully reintroducing him to the United States. Uh, but he did remarkable things as he's responsible for uh, basically the American land grant institution. So all our state schools have a heritage back to him. Uh, he engaged in a lot of really interesting Stoic uh, marching practices. He can march somewhere between 30 and 80 miles a day and do that repetitively. Uh, he inspired the Vermont Long Trail, which inspired the creation of the American Appalachian Trail. Um, he was the third superintendent of our U.S. Military Academy at West Point and helped shape a lot of the training and education that occurs there. So incredibly remarkable um, genius, military genius in his own right. And uh, Interestingly enough, I found that he had his education theory was perfectly compatible to a Prussian general a strategist, probably one of the most famous strategists uh, that ever lived, Karl von Clausewitz, sometimes referred to as the dead Prussian. Uh, he, his theories are still debated today. He's probably within the top three strategists that's debated when it comes to modern war and how to shape war. But those two individuals, half a world apart and using different languages, were writing theories that were completely compatible to each other, even though those countries had no friendly relations at the time. And the question is, how did that occur? So the deeper I looked into that, I traced it back um, with the help of some other scholars to a, uh, to a, a neo-Stoic philosopher, Ramondo Montecuccoli, which was a a military philosopher that was uh, during the Thirty Years' War that basically took um, the theories of Justice Lipsius, the original neo-Stoic that we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation, and converted it to the military aspect. Well, the works of Monte Kukli, uh were given to George Washington, and even though I can't prove it because the historical records have been lost, but the a book of the appropriate age sits at West Point Military Academy today in their library that was most likely read by Captain Alden Partridge. And then Monty Kukuli's work was also cited heavily by Gerard von Scar Scarnhorst, a, a general that was uh, very important in shaping Prussian education and military system. And his, obviously, mentee Karl von Klotzwitz got a lot of that Stoic philosophy through him. So even though they're half a world apart, and there's a hundred, whatever, that half a world apart, they were using the same philosophical basis, larger worldview that they could build their military philosophies off of. And that's why they were so compatible with each other. So my agenda today, which is listed out very clearly here, but it will be a lot more complex as we go through it. So I'll walk you through several different phases of Stoic philosophy as it goes through the years, and then we'll talk about some other um, current Stoic iterations that are kind of important to discuss in this context. Um, I'll give you some example of archetypal stories that fit into each of these schools that will explain these philosophies in a story form that tends to be a lot easier to understand. And then finally, I'll talk about how the direct connections of Stoic philosophy and the military, how those may have been lost um, and kind of in the recent century, and then how we can return to a more explicit understanding of Stoic philosophy in the military. Now, I apologize. So when I originally wrote this brief, I was assuming I'd be talking to a lot of military veterans. So I'm going <laughs> to talk a little bit before I get into this slide. So 
uh, Greek warfare is quite interesting in how it shapes uh, Western society. So uh, if we go back to ancient Athens, the primary kind of soldier would be the hoplite, which would be heavy infantrymen. And this would be something that the was a landowner that would fight on land and they would fight over land rights is basically how the, the military was positioned. Uh, the hoplite or who could afford the armor had the, the right to vote. So your entry into democracy was based on your ability to acquire armor and your willingness to go out in the, the field and fight. If you weren't willing to fight, you didn't have the right to vote. If you couldn't afford those arms, you couldn't vote. Interesting enough, uh, if you're a really wealthy man, extremely wealthy, and you could own a horse and be cavalry, that was cool. You could ride around your horse and everybody would think you're, you're kind of nice, but you were only really thought to be courageous and warlike if you're willing to dismount and fight with the what we think is the, the middle class. So if you fought in the phalanx, you would be considered more honorable than using your kind of extreme wealth to buy fancier equipment. Because of the nature of the, the phalanx and the, the armor at the time, basically your shield uh, defended the right side of the person standing next to you and the formations had to stay together to be functional and to fight well. So as a result, the main focus of Western military became a focus on your ability to fight as a member of a team instead of your individual kind of military prowess. So this will die off kind of the Middle Ages where you see the knights kind of charging by themselves and trying to be their own heroes. Well, kind of in the, the age of Greek warfare, it was about whether or not you can fight as a team member so it wasn't about you trying to kill the most amount of people or kind of take the, the kill the enemy general. It was like, can you stand in line and can you can you protect and defend your, your peer as you go to war? And that will have a long-standing impact on kind of the Western military tradition or what we think of a good soldier even to date. So with that, we begin our story at uh, Sparta, uh, which is a great place to start when you talk about military, really. I'm sure a lot of people have watched 300, really the stylized movie about the culture. Really interesting culture. Uh, they had a, a legendary or myth mythological founder called Lycurgus that gave laws. Uh, many different kings actually used his name to kind of shape uh, the warrior culture. But Lycurgus was said to give a, a system of laws to Sparta that shaped them into a warlike nation. And some of the interesting aspects of Sparta is it was illegal not to be engaging in self-development. So if you weren't constantly working on whether it was your physical fitness or other capabilities, you could be basically charged with a crime. So everyone in Sparta was expected to be getting better all the time. Uh, if you watch 300, you're probably aware of the Agogi, uh, which is the schoolhouse where uh, boys of seven years old would enter into the kind of the grueling task of becoming a soldier. They'd be introduced to the extremes of environment, hunger, hardship, um, in order to basically build their military might in their, their hopes of military domination for their culture. Uh, not always true in all periods, but the Spartans adopted a mode of money made of iron bricks that were so large that they required wagons to carry. And the intent behind that was you can show off your wealth because you can carry a lot of money around with you. So basically it normalized their society so that the, the non-slaves, so what we think of the actual Spartan warriors, basically all looked the same in terms of their dress attire. And there was no way of really showing off your opulence if you were more wealthy. Than. The, cult, the culture of the Spartans were built entirely around um, basically their ability to engage in warfare and that uh, deeply impacted their their sense of worth. So the Spartans were said to um, appreciate a, a, a crothon, which is a cup that could separate the sediment or mud out of water when you drink it versus a cup over gold because that had practical value of a soldier versus something that was flashy or what we think now today is valuable. It said that the Spartans banned philosophy, um, but if you look kind of into their culture, they really banned what we think of as uh, kind of academic um, philosophy. So they would allow kind of what we think of stoicism. So 
if we want to get into the debate about what the color red means or like how do we know we're not in the simulation or like what do we think of as what is really real man they would say that's all a waste of time like what you see is what you get um only practical things are to be discussed and we're not going into what we think of as like navel gazing of the current modern academic philosophy and uh it's also important to note, which most people understand, that Sparta was uh, supported by a slave class, and that's basically the way that they were able to gain their, their military power. And unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, just because of the nature of their society and how they geared themselves to the war, um, ultimately the upper class of Sparta never could reproduce fast enough to maintain their empire, and that's how Sparta eventually self-destructed. So what we know of Sparta is actually captured um, by uh, a guy named Xenophon of Athens. He uh, was a great military hero in his own right. Um, Sparta itself didn't keep any written records that we know of, or no written records have survived. So it was actually an Athenian that actually recorded the Spartan's law that we have now, which if anyone's not read the Constitution of the Lacedaemonians or Constitution of Athens, it's really worth the time to go back and read those and take a look at kind of what the Greek society was. Xenophon himself was a friend of Socrates, and uh, I'm sure most people have read uh, Plato's Apology, but Xenophon himself wrote um, a memorabilia, which also talks about the death of Socrates. Um, and he presents a, well, I don't want to use the word spiteful, uh, maybe a slightly more arrogant version uh, or defiant version of Socrates than Plato does. So it's well worth the, the read the difference of how those two authors present the death of Socrates. And uh, probably his greatest work that he wrote was the Anabasis. So when he was about 30 years of age, he went um, with the mercenary army with the intent to take over the Persian empire. Uh, his leader gets killed and all of a sudden there's 10,000 Greeks in the middle of the Persian empire that are basically cut off. So it's the story of him being elected as one of the generals of this force that has to flee out of the Persian Empire and make a basically a thousand mile run out of enemy territory. It's absolutely a fascinating work of military uh, history. It's a fascinating work in terms of it has more motivational speeches than you could imagine in that work. It's, it's absolutely great. Um, well worth the time to read in that book. Um, the Anabasis was actually used well into the 20th century to teach intro uh, to ancient Greek, how to read and write it. Um, so if we think about it, most people's in history's introduction to the ancient Greek language was through this really epic story of uh, military conquest uh, by a guy that would, you could deem as a proto-Stoic, would carry a lot of the ideas that would be cemented into Stoicism. So Socrates um, probably goes without the need for introducing, probably the, the single most important Greek philosopher of the era. He ends up uh, committing suicide, drinking um, hemlock for corrupting the city because uh, the people of uh, Athens don't like what he's teaching. Uh, it's important to realize that he was a hoplite himself and he fought in three of the major battles defending um, Athens, and he was uh, noted for his bravery in the formation, um, and that's noted by several individuals. Um, Epictetus, there, um, one of the Stoics, quotes his his bravery. He was a great lover of uh, Stoic uh, or Spartan culture, just for the simplicity and kind of the military aspects of it. So he assumed some of the behavior of the Spartans. So if we take a look in. The photo up there, what most of us think of, if I said, hey, what's what an ancient Greek philosopher would look like? We typically think of that gray cloak, kind of the old man. Well, that gray cloak actually is what a, a Spartan officer would wear if he was like wearing casual attire. So a lot of people don't connect that what we think of a philosopher is actually wearing military attire. Um, <laughs> so Plato's Apology, probably the most single most um, important work in uh, Kind of Greek uh, philosophy records his death. And then uh, inside that work, Socrates uses his military service as a metaphor for life, the struggle, and uh, kind of the difficulty of wrestling with kind of the challenges of life. <laughs>
So finally, 10 slides in, we finally get to the topic of stoicism, what we're here today. So Zeno of Xenophon, or sorry, yeah, Zeno of Sintium uh, was a merchant, ends up getting shipwrecked. And when he uh, gets shipwrecked, he finds a book on uh, Socrates, believed to be the work of actually Xenophon. And he basically re, re his life towards philosophy. He'll say that when he lost his fortune, it was the greatest day of his life. Um, and he'll build a, a, what we think of now as Stoic philosophy, uh, around the virtue-based system using the, the four cardinal virtues of wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Some aspects about this um, philosophy is it's highly connected with nature and will look towards nature um, uh, to determine justice and other matters. It also will encourage people to take long walks into nature and really get away from people. Um, it will teach amore fate or the love of fate. And this is probably would have been easier to understand inside the Greek world than our current context. But if you think of the Greek pantheon, the gods were always playing havoc with humanity. So um, there was no expectation that if you were a good person that you would have a good life. So really virtue itself is its own reward and the gods are going to either give you or take away from you what they will. And interesting enough, as a kind of small aside, if the gods really hated you, they'd give you everything you wanted because that was the fastest way to destroy a person. So if you were being punished in life, it may have indicated that you were well loved by gods. So kind of a different way that we look um, at things today. It taught um, what we think of as cosmopolitanism, and we'll get into that a little in the uh, next couple slides, but it's the concept that you are a citizen of the world or all humanity is united. Had the dichotomy of control. So there's certain things in life that you have direct control over, other things you don't, and your purpose is basically to direct your actions or your thoughts towards that which you can control. So for example, I can't control what people's opinions of, of me and my reputation. I can't control it, but I can control my own character and more, my own actions. So I shouldn't be worried about what anyone's thinking of me, but I should be worried about whether or not I'm acting out of virtue or not. Uh, in Stoicism would acknowledge uh, emotional responses to situations, but ultimately they would default to the use of reason to resolve problems. Uh, they did acknowledge that women were equally capable of exercising uh, virtue, and they actually would engage in instructing women uh, in philosophy. And then in secondary sources, because unfortunately we've lost Zeno's Republic, um, we do know that Zeno's ideal city, there wouldn't have been uh, any slavery allowed, mainly because his whole society would have, been, would have been built up by sages, so nothing but wise individuals would be allowed inside the city. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, cosmopolitanism and kind of some of the modern impacts today and how it relates to kind of how we interpret things today. So in the modern context, we can say we understand that how we interpret cosmopolitanism is, is fundamentally based on our underlying psychological architecture. So about 40% of how we're going to interpret this is actually genetic based. About 60% of it is how we're raised. And there's really two variables here on a spectrum. We either can lean socially liberal or socially conservative, and those aren't necessarily political views, but they can they they correlate with political assumptions. But when when Zeno first wrote his <coughs> his Republic, he used uh, basically Greek particularism, and it was a thought that you. Um, had certain duties to certain individuals and their relation to you dictated how, to what degree of uh, duties or obligations you had to them. Um, so Heracles, which was a, a second century um, Stoic, made these rings and a fragment that we have, but essentially you owe more to yourself or have more obligation to yourself than you have to your family. And then as it radiates out, you have less and less duty but the theory was, um, at least in the later works of Zeno, that you attempt to flatten this. So as you go out into the world, like I have a duty to myself and my family, I have a duty to my fellow citizens, but ultimately I want to 
live to the point where I start treating my fellow citizens as my family or even to myself, I take higher regard to them. And uh, it's an interesting construct because uh, in the original works of Zeno, he is very much writing in kind of a more conservative stance about the different relationships and duties. But his later works, he really kind of increases the construct of cosmopolitanism or how you have to go out and interact. Some, some scholars assert that's more of a personal ethos than an actual direction, like, hey, you as an individual, as you're going around the world, should really try to act like a good citizen of whatever country you're in, um, versus what we may have find individuals today saying, hey, we need to shift to like a one world government because stoicism says that we should make everyone equal. Uh, you'll find that people that tend to be more socially conservative will orientate more towards the nuclear family, and those that tend to be more socially liberal tend to orientate more towards society on the political realm. Um, and it's unfortunate that at least in academia, we've seen kind of a more increase or a distillation of a lot of our academics towards one spectrum. So when they approach topics like this, they don't necessarily give the range of interpretation. They're just giving kind of one side of the spectrum. <laughs> Okay, so getting into the famous uh, military ancient Stoics, uh, probably the greatest of the, the military Stoics was uh, Scipio Africanus, the man that defeats Hannibal. Interesting, uh, it's well worth the time to check out the work by um, Hart um, discussing him. Uh, everyone probably knows Napoleon. Napoleon's thought to be one of the greatest strategists that ever lived. Well, Scipio Africanus actually outdid Napoleon. He's probably the greatest strategist that actually ever applied um, forces on the battlefield. It's quite amazing. He would completely different, differently array his forces and use different tactics. Literally every engagement he went into, so his enemy never knew how to attack or defend against him. Um, quite interesting and kind of unfortunate that we remember his enemy that we defeated, but we don't remember Scipio more. <coughs> Next one, Marcus Aurelius, um, the emperor, probably one of the best known as the Stoics. He actually wrote the meditations when he was actually on the front line of a battlefield. Um, there's nothing inside the meditations that necessarily references that, but it's important to know that that was being written at the time. Uh, Donald Robinson's How to Think Like a Roman Empire kind of discusses some of that, that military history tradition. And finally, and probably most importantly to the United States and really modern democracies, was a guy named Cato the Younger. He was um, a Roman senator that opposed the tyrant Julius Caesar and took, um, took armies out to fight against Caesar. Ultimately, he lost uh, and they saw the downfall of the Roman uh, Republic, the establishment of the Roman Empire. Um, he understood that uh, that Julius Caesar could have used him as like basically a political pawn if he would have accepted um, a pardon from Caesar. So in order to refuse um, Caesar or spite Caesar to say, hey, you have no authority in the Roman Republic, like I'm a Roman, true Roman, he actually will commit suicide um, in order not to be captured or taken prisoner by Julius Caesar. And his story will become incredibly important for the American Republic in the future, but will also impact the British Whig Party in some degree. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how much would have affected the Canadian evolution. Uh, Rome's Last Citizen is a great book that tells both the story of Cato and then the later, later impacts on the later republics. So the uh, archetypal story of Stoicism, if you want to really put Stoicism in a story form instead of just a straight philosophy form, is Virgil's Aeneid. It tells the story of Aeneas, who is a survivor of the Trojan War, and how the Trojans fled after the Greeks defeated Troy, so after the Iliad. They go on a series of adventures and eventually found Rome. Uh, Aeneid himself is uh, a demigod and displays all the great virtues. <coughs> uh, 
of a great stoic. Um, but it's interesting that he himself will display a human fault. He'll go into the underworld and he'll get advice from his father about how to establish Rome. His father will say, do not show mercy, do not kill the, the, the man you have to vanquish. But ultimately, he'll kill Turnus because he's wearing um, the armor of a, of a friend that Turnus killed in battle. So he's overtaken by rage. And uh, it's a really interesting construct because this is this story shows that even basically a demigod, even the greatest of the Stoics, could default and act non-Stoically on the battlefield. But there is redemption and there is a chance to come back to the philosophy um, in the story. Uh, this text was used um, basically from the second century AD onwards to, to help teach Latin. And up until the 1960s in America, like 90% of American students would have been exposed to the story in high school. <coughs> so there's a question of why did Stoicism lose its uh, prominence and ultimately it was displaced by Christianity. So the, the beautiful thing about Stoicism is it taught people how to basically face death. Like, hey, focus on here and now. Stoic is very materialistic, so when he died, basically that was it. Um, it gave a solution to how to calm the fears while you're living through this philosophy. However, you have the Christian tradition that came in, wasn't materialistic. Hey, believe in Jesus. If you die, you go to heaven. It's a lot easier to believe in uh, a theology than a more complicated philosophy. And so it was largely replaced by Christianity. And then it set dormant. Um, it was it was carried to some degree by the scholastic um, community. The humanists uh, did maintain their knowledge of Stoicism, um, but really the man that was credited to reinducing uh, Stoic philosophy to the world was a guy named Justus Lipsius. He's a Flemish humanist, and uh, his most famous work is On Consistency, which is a wonderful work. Uh, what he did was he basically combined uh, Stoic philosophy with Christian theology. Now, Stoicism and Christianity have conflicts between them. So Stoicism is deterministic and materialistic. So you only get to hear now what you can see, and it's deterministic. So the gods have already determined your life path. Well, those aspects had to be removed. So in areas of conflict, basically, it was defaulted to Christian theology. <coughs> Um, some interesting things, and I wish that this would have been taught more in school. How many people read The Prince or Machiavelli when they went to school, or who knows The Prince or Machiavelli? No one? Okay. You, it's a typically assignment to read Machiavelli or The Prince, so it was very much uh, kind of do, do what you want as long as you can get away with it. Whatever is the benefit for the king is good for society. You can be backhanded. You know, nothing matters, kind of really narcissistic. Well, this would have been like a generation after Machiavelli, where this offered to really counter the Machiavellianism. So a good prince ruled with justice, he ruled um, with temperance towards God, and uh, just created a lot better civilization than what would happen if we would have totally embraced Machiavellianism. The primary source that uh, Justice Lipsius uh, used was Seneca um, in terms of interpreting his new philosophy. And that really sparked a whole wave of other neo-Stoics across Europe to hunt through libraries to find other Stoics to base their own version of neo-Stoicism off of. In a large way, we can say thank the neo-Stoics because without the neo-Stoics, um, a lot of the original Stoic uh, material may have been lost to time. So they were the ones that really started the hunt to go back and find uh, the works of the Stoics. The other famous uh, neo-Stoic, uh, was Hugo Brutus. Um, he would actually take neo-Stoic philosophy and he is credited uh, to essentially forming what we now think of international law. So what we think of as our basis for international law is actually based on neo-Stoicism. And then he would go on to write a very uh, famous work, work on the law of war and peace, which is basically the foundation of the law of modern warfare. And that would be carried into combat um, by uh, King Gustav Adolphus, which we'll talk 
uh, a little bit further on in this briefing, but he is known as the father of combined arms. For those of you who don't know what combined arms is, it was a, a method of using uh, cavalry, infantry, and artillery on the battlefield together at the same time to maximize their effect. Um, and to some degree, that's that same theory is attempting to be applied right now on the battlefield. So the, the theories that came out of this are still on the battlefield today. The Neo-Stoic virtues took the four cardinal virtues from Stoicism and combined them with uh, essentially the three uh, Christian virtues, which is faith, hope, and charity or love. And uh, with that displayed on the screen, all of those three new virtues can also be interpreted in a non-theological fashion. Just in some ways, I can say that this is an excellent model in terms of applying this uh, to the future of kind of warfare or future of society that we don't necessarily have to believe in the theological aspects of them. But if we could all agree, hey, these are just seven good virtues to live by and move forward, you know, our society would be a lot better off. And uh, up there on the top right hand side is uh, Stockdale. Uh, he was a Vietnam, uh, Vietnam fighter pilot that got shot down and held for multiple years as a POW. Um, quite a fascinating uh, character. They, they uh, coined the term Stockdale paradox after him, which is the ability to confront the brutal facts of whatever you're facing but still maintaining optimism or hope for completing one's mission into the future. Uh, it's well worth uh, the time to study that individual. Um, interesting enough, the prisoners, or he had read the works of Epictetus before he was taken prisoner. Interesting enough, the people that were housed with him in the POW camp, even though they were exposed to years and years of torture, actually had less rates of PTSD after their events than the average uh, Vietnam veteran because of the philosophy he was teaching his fellow POWs was safeguarding their mental health. Okay, so, uh, so the features of Neo-Stoicism, uh, it's the belief that humans are driven by their passion. Uh, there was four that was listed by Lipsius, so greed, joy, fear, and sorrow, but the goal was ultimately to be obedient um, through God. Freedom was found through reasoning or overcoming our base instincts. Um, there's a belief that evil exists due to the faults of men, but even when sin occurs, God is ultimately going to use that sin to do some type of better action um, in life. It's quite interesting that this is one of the few <coughs> philosophies that allows kind of bad stuff in life to happen. It's not utopian by any means. Um, we already talked about the rejection of determinism. Uh, it stresses the use of compassion, which is empathy tempered by reason, and it prioritizes um, action over words. So Lipsius has some beautiful passages about helping the poor or the injured, where you should just go do it and not talk about it, and that if you meet a man that's whatever in a terrible position, you don't sit down and cry with him. You raise him out of his position and you help him. Out of this era, we had this new uh, new revolutions of technology. So when Je uh, Lipsius was writing, um, firearms were coming onto the battlefield uh, because of the impact of firearms. Basically, nations were expanding um, because you needed a larger tax, tax base to maintain larger militaries. And some militaries uh, attempted to do so by mercenary armies, and they had terrible impacts because mercenaries couldn't be trusted because they had a tendency to loot the countries that they were paid to protect or they would rape their women. So was, there was a big push, push to try to find a more virtuous aspect of warfare. So you see the rise of the citizen soldier construct. And basically you wanted to have citizens out of the own towns to defend those towns because they could be trusted to go back and live in society. And you also see the rise of uh, the attempt to, to operate off of a, a militia. So uh, uh, Gerard von Scarnhorst will attempt to uh, persuade the Prussians to adapt a mil uh, militia-based system. Ultimately it failed, but that militia system he gets put into place allows uh, Prussia to rapidly expand their military, which really helps them during the Napoleonic Wars. And then 
the United States, because of this influence, attempts to run a, a totally militia-based system. Um, if you look at our constitution, our army is only supposed to exist for two years. So we're supposed to have a militia. If we go to the war, then we build an army out of the militia and we go fight. And as soon as the war is over, we get rid of the standing army. So this is a scholar I study. So out of the neo-Stoic kind of philosophy, the whole construct of education or, or how we were supposed to train our citizens was really radically different in, than what we're doing now, much more broad scoped. So a single individual should understand their, their own government. They should be able to participate in the government office when they leave college. They should understand the major major fields of wealth. They should understand like architecture or uh, agriculture, commerce, manufacturing. They should understand foreign policy within their own country and how uh, other people's uh, foreign policy will affect their own country. Um, they should be able to engage in civic duties. Uh, they should be able to endure great fatigue. So they're trained in physical fitness and discomfort. Um, and they essentially all educated men would be trained in the militia and capable of taking up arms. And that would impact the way that they voted, which would safeguard a, a republic. Very much a polymathic approach. Um, did anyone in here ever read uh, Tocqueville? Alexis de Tocqueville on democracy, great work. Uh, he feared that uh, industrialism would focus people on basically making one widget in the machine. And because you became a hyper specialist, you could never basically find another job because you always had to find a job in your specialty, which may not exist in different companies. Mm -hmm. This approach to education basically would have safeguarded um, our modern society from that over specialization and kind of the dangers of kind of extreme capitalism. <laughs> Brings us back to Karl von Clausewitz, the great dead Prussian. Uh, there's some great um, stoic references inside his most famous book on war. Um, this is probably the most uh, most explicit one, saying that a commander should be able to uh, make decisions on the battlefield, even though there's a storm of spirit, even though all the emotions are raging within inside them, they should be able to keep them their, their cool and command. Uh, he used a command theory called mission command. And what mission command is, is uh, basically a senior commander gives intent to a junior commander. So they're not actually giving uh, explicit directions on how to attack. They're just saying, hey, I intend you to go out there and attack this hill. At the end of the attack, this is what I want you to accomplish. And essentially the junior commander, when they're going across the battlefield, if they find different ways to exploit or change their orders, as long as you're meeting that intent, um, it works incredibly successful. Um, that mission command approach basically demands absolute trust up and down the chain of command, which is very difficult for uh, militaries to train for and establish and use effectively. Uh, but most modern militaries are desperately trying to use this approach. And one of the reasons that I would suggest that they're failing is they don't understand the philosophy or the philosophical value systems they have to build in their soldiers to get to this point. And as mentioned earlier, he's probably one of the most influential uh, strategists for the 20th and 21st century, uh, heavily used by the uh, Austrians and Germans during World War I. Uh, World War II, the US Army was just in being introduced to him. Um, basically, all the planning for the modern wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are always bounced off his theories. Um, and it's arguably how well we can apply them. So the question is, how much did neo-Stoicism affect the American founding fathers? Uh, and the answer is we were incredibly, at least the American Republic was very much a Stoic uh, country when it was first founded. Thomas Jefferson, he claimed to be a uh, Epicurean, uh, but if you looked out at the list of what his own personal philosophy was, like over 50% of what he wrote down his own personal philosophy could be directly related to Stoicism. Uh, he was frequently uh, recommending the works of Stoics, uh, the people that would ask him for book readings. And then he was known for his uh, ability uh, to take long walks like the famous Stoics. Uh, there was a play written called Cato, A Tragedy uh, in Britain by Joseph Addison. And this play was kind of revolutionary in the fact that when it was produced in Britain, 
everyone thought it was talking to their political party. So every political party embraced the 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 play and said, hey, this is, you know, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Uh, this is the story about us being the hero. Uh, it is said that Cato the tragedy, with the exception of uh, Death of the Salesman, is one of the most played plays ever put on in the American Republic. Unfortunately, almost no one knows what it is now, but it shows you the absolute popularity of at the time. Um, there's some really interesting quotes from George Washington when he was fighting um, in the British Army, saying that he wished he was at home just being a, a Juba, a character playing this play on the stage instead of fighting on the battlefield. Uh, the play was actually performed for the officers at Valley Forge to encourage them um, to fight, really to be the Cato's of the day. Um, inside are uh, the quotes of the American Founding Fathers. You'll find tremendous amounts of references or paraphrasings of this play. I regret that I have one life to give to my country. Um, I could go on and on. Um, and then both uh, George Washington and Samuel Adams were frequently referred to as Cato, with King George III referred to as Caesar. And uh, the one final quote, which I love from Samuel Adamson, is that he wished that he could make Boston a Christian Sparta, which is really a different way of saying neo stoic so without a doubt, American Republic was founded out of Stoicism. So that brings us into kind of the archetypal story of like in story form, how would we look at Neo-Stoicism? Uh, what brings us to Daniel Defoe, really a genius of the era. Uh, we would know him as uh, really a genius on the level of Newton if he wouldn't have attacked pretty much every political leader of his day. He found himself constantly being thrown in jail. Uh, he wrote something like 400 works in his era or his day. He was a soldier, a spy, a very famous author, uh, wrote a great um, treatise of ideas called The Projects. Uh, one of the projects was an uh, idea for a university for women, but one of them was a uh, idea for a military academy um, for uh, the British, and that likely influenced Captain Alden Partridge and his design of the, the U.S. Army ROTC program. He's best known for his work, uh, uh, his trilogy of Robinson Crusoe. I love this, like, 50-word, can you imagine doing this today? It's like a 50-word title. But that, <laughs> that first one is Robinson Crusoe, <laughs> then Further Adventures, but this is the long title. Um, and then he has a third work, uh, most people will never know that the work is a trilogy, which is a shame. Um, if you ever go and read it, I suggest you read the first two books to actually get the story. The last book is actually a straight philosophy that references back to the story um, for context. Second to the Bible, this has been translated into more languages around the world than any other book. Um, once again, the first two stories tell of his adventure. The last book is written like traditional philosophy. Um, it's fairly easy to find translations, um, or at least current prints of the first two books. Uh, the last book, um, the only works I've ever found still have the median S or F in them. So if you if you read, it's it's it can be difficult because you have a character that looks like a different letter of the alphabet. One of the great quotes inside his third work is the fable is made for the moral, not the moral for the fable. So there are some uh, tremendous errors that we never tolerate in the modern novel. So like in the first novel, there's a goat that keeps changing their sex, depends on what they need for the story. Um, but to some degree, we have to forgive him kind of his faults in his story writing because he's trying to get us to the certain kind of philosophical points and not necessarily have a a perfectly written story. And this was also written way before word processing. And he managed to write the first book in like a year. He wrote the second book in a year and a half. Amazing stuff. So the give you an overview of the first book. He's a disobedient uh, son. He leaves home because he wants to go to have adventures. He travels to Africa. Um, I should say he gets on a ship. The ship, ship sinks. He doesn't take that as good. It doesn't get his lesson. He gets on a different boat. That one makes it the Africa makes a brings home stuff, makes a fortune, wants to go back to Africa, do it again. Um, second trip, he actually gets taken into slavery. Um, he escapes slavery by stealing a boat. 
uh, the boat gets picked up by a, a big ship. He gets taken to Brazil. He manages to buy a whole bunch of land in Brazil. He becomes this incredibly wealthy plantation owner. He has no reason to ever want for anything in his life. Um, but there's other Brazilian um, plantation owners that come to him saying, hey, you know, Africa, the slave trade has been shut down. We're going to get a ship and go collect slaves. Will you take us back to Africa to collect slaves? So he goes, yeah, sure, why not? I like adventure. And then at that point, he gets shipwrecked um, on his way um, to go get slaves. He spends 28 years um, in isolation on an island, mostly alone. And he has to face fears of being captured by cannibal tribes. Um, he does rescue a colony of Spaniards. He ends up rescuing three other Englishmen, or actually not rescuing him. He ends up having three other Englishmen on that colony, he starts a little colony, and then he only escapes by fighting with pirates. Cool story, right? That's book one. So the theme, I, the beautiful thing about Robinson Crusoe is the other older archetypal story is about a demigod, right? So Aeneas, really great guy, high birth. Robinson Crusoe, wretch of a man, terrible man. Like he's like literally the stoic everyman. So like anybody read or listen to Amazing Grace by John Newton, he's like really the wretch of a man. Like he's an evil man at the beginning of the story. Um, but he finds himself in solitude in nature and that's one of the ways that he ends up healing himself. Heavily focuses on the dichotomy of control. Uh, there's a multiple series of uh, secular re uh, redemptions in this story. So he'll have a kind of a religious experience. He gets sick on the island, almost dies. He comes to uh, appreciate the Lord, keeps a holy day. He goes on, he forgets kind of his religion, his philosophy. Life falls apart. He remembers it again, life gets better. He forgets it, falls apart. He remembers it, he gets better. So it's this kind of cycle of learning how to be a good stoic along the way. Uh, he learns gratitude, self-reliance, and then ultimately industry uh, to improve his life. It's very difficult to take a look at Robinson Crusoe because our, most of our current academic um, scholars come from kind of a Hegelian Marxist or post-structuralist, you can say post-modernist philosophy, which is very hostile to some of the underlying assumptions of, of Stoicism. So a lot of the times they'll skew their interpretation of the story and it's really unfortunate. So they often will look at this story through kind of power structures. They'll accuse them of colonialism or slavery. And it's kind of interesting because you read the story, the really story rejects kind of their own critiques. So there are several times where Robinson Crusoe will actually praise the Spaniards for the, the native cannibals more than Englishmen. And it would be really weird to be a a colonialist praising England and then all you do is talk about how other societies are better than you. He actually never takes any part of the island that's actually used by the cannibal tribe. So he's not really colonizing things, he's just occupying empty land. And he makes sure that um, that kind of ritual land is actually reserved and not used by anyone else. Um, they do take uh, essentially captive natives because he's afraid that if they turn them loose that, uh, that they'll go back and tell their buddies, so they do keep them. Um, however, he gives them land and teaches them how to farm if they wish to farm. So they give them land, tools, education, or if they wish to essentially be employees to other people, they, he allows them to be employees. So he's not, he's not abusing the people that get stuck on his island. And then in the second story, his boat tries to be taken over by Chinese pirates and they end up fighting him off, but one of the pirates gets beaten to death and you see this really long um, rant about like how sorry he was and really embracing kind of shared humanity with this, this Chinese pirate, which is really odd to think like, well, why would a colonial care about someone that was in his own culture? But here you see this man really mourning that he couldn't save the life of a wicked man. Um, slavery, so the topic of slavery is kind of difficult in this story because well, first of all, slavery would have been legal in every country in the world during the time that the story is written. He, Crusoe himself, ends up being a slave and then he goes to take slaves. So he doesn't outwardly ever say like, hey, slavery is bad and it shouldn't be done. So there's no real moral judgment made on the book, but he does, he does ensure that the, the natives that are taken prisoner 
don't become slaves. So it's not explicitly stated saying, hey, this is a evil institution, but his actions suggest that he doesn't support it. Karl Marx ends up attacking Robinson Crusoe and he either is ignorant of the second book or he blatantly lies, but he has this idea that the um, 16 men that he leaves on a colony could basically work together and they could all produce food for each other and everything would be wonderful and great and uh, a perfect communism, uh, you could say. Uh, but in the actual story, three of the 16 men, the Englishmen, actually want to be kings. And uh, essentially the Spaniards at the island say, hey, we'll make everything you need. We'll food you or we'll give you food, we'll give you clothing, just live in peace. But even offered everything they, they could imagine just to live in sloth, those three men want to make themselves king. So war erupts on the island. So, uh, and that's explained in that second part of the book. So really neo-stoicism accounts for the fact that they're just going to be evil men in the world or there's going to be evils that occur and it's it's not a utopia so even if you could teach everyone like not everyone's going to behave how many have seen this movie the martian okay that's the, that's the modern remake of robinson crusoe and you probably didn't probably didn't notice it but they substitute the word science for reason in that book but it's the same same story so if you get caught on mars try to control your emotions Try to calm yourself down, think rationally through problems, be hopeful, work towards a solution. Um, great story. Uh, to some degree, I, it, it lacks some of the personal interactions that the original story would have had, so they should have left someone else to be isolated with them, like kind of get more into depth than the human element. Mm -hmm. Other great neo-stoic archetypal stories, so Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, amazing guy. Uh, so you, you have several characters, Aragon, um, even the hobbits display neo stoic um, uh, characteristics. Gandalf becomes kind of the, the main examples. Uh, J.K. Rowling's by some philosophers are suggested that she recreated a modern version of neo stoicism within the first uh, three books of her series. So they're, most modern philosophers will credit her for kind of advancing the concept of neo stoicism, which most people don't. You never sit down. How many people sit down and analyze the virtue structures of the stories? <laughs> so inside the United States, we had a movement called the Transcendentalists, um, which I would argue at least part of it was a distinctly American version of neo-Stoicism. Um, a lot of modern uh, philosophy departments don't want to deal with the Transcendentalists, so they call it a literary movement, so they can just skip by it. Uh, interestingly enough, Harvard's uh, Harvard's Department of Philosophy is housed in Emerson's Hall, which they now don't consider Emerson a philosopher. So you can take that as it is. Um, interesting influence of the Unitarian Universalist Church. So it was right um, in an era where more religious texts from non-Christian um, sources became available. And this church basically said, hey, you can go out and read these other, other theologies and search for basically goodness or divineness. Um, so, in a way, it opened the door for uh, a non-theological version of neo-Stoicism. So, um, searching through various different religions, you don't have to be Christian to get to the same philosophical ends. The most famous of the, um, I should say, Emersonian idealists, or those that supported individualism, is Emerson and Thoreau. Anyone read any of their works? Okay. Um, Emerson himself is often confused for Stoics or Stoicism, or he he uh, he sounds so much like a Stoic that if you go on any modern Stoic discussion board, you almost always find quotes from Emerson himself. Um, in his works, he often quotes uh, Marcus Aurelius, but he'll use his Roman name Antonius, so a lot of people don't catch up on or catch catch exactly who he's referencing in some of his texts. Um, Interesting enough, he is the first um, American philosopher to distinctly say that all American scholars should be Stoics. So he, in the middle of the, the war, he distinctly says, hey, all American graduates should be Stoics. And once again, we see in here his reference that, that essentially all educated men uh, should be armed and complete men. 
So this was written in the heart of the American Civil War that he believed that um, essentially all educated men would have some type of martial ability and ability to defend themselves. And the transcendentalists uh, were really at the, the cusp of first wave feminism, so they supported the education and rights of women. And they believed in the total sovereignty of the individual to determine truth, which makes them um, natural uh, abolitionists, and they will help spark the American Civil War. So I can't come to Canada without giving something back. Uh, <laughs> Lucy Maud Montgomery actually wrote probably the finest Emersonian idealist archetypal story for young women. So if anyone hasn't read that, I encourage you to read it. Um, she actually started, actually she wrote the first book when she was in Massachusetts in 1907, really in the backyard of the transcendentalist, um, but she would carry on and write um, further the story back in Canada. Um, a tremendous m uh, number of Americans, when they read that, will recognize the transcendentalist uh, philosophy and picture it in New England and not in Canada. Okay, a very famous man, which I wish, wish, desperately wish the U.S. military would remember more, was a guy named Thomas Wentworth Higginson. He was a Unitarian minister. He was a very staunch abolitionist that um, as time went by, he increasingly turned towards the use of violence. He was actually one of six men that funded John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. I really need to do some more research to find out why he was tried by Congress for paying for that terrorist attack. Um, but somehow he managed not to get tied up by Congress in that. Um, during the war, he commanded the first regiment made up of freed slaves. Uh, tremendously difficult task. One slip or one error of that regiment would have set back the, the African Americans to no end, where whatever they wouldn't be trusted in military service. Um, he wrote a book called The Army Life and the Black Regiment that details his experiences. But he lays out this beautiful kind of EO opportunity approach that could still be used today. So basically he defined the requirements of what a soldier was, and then he judged based people based on their ability to perform that role as a, as a soldier, and that was it. And uh, people would come to him and say, there was no way that you could get uh, a white soldier to drill underneath a black NCO, but as long as you could focus men on kind of soldiering, they, it, everything would fall in line. He did make sure that all the uh, pejorative terms weren't used um, in his formation, and that was both um, within the community and above the community. Um, it, and I invite you to read the book. He goes into much more detail about why he did that. Um, but just a remarkable man. And if there was any doubt about his connection to Stoicism, um, during the war itself, he was actually uh, translating the work of Epictetus. So you imagine uh, the direct connection there. Um, he was known to mimic the Stoic toughening training of Captain Alden Partridge. Um, so he uh, went mountain climbing in like the blizzards and snowstorms, trying to um, do what Captain Partridge did, like a, essentially a generation earlier. Higginson and uh, Emerson would eventually have a falling out and they would have an argument. And to some degree, uh, it's unfortunate because after this conflict, um, uh, Higginson would turn much more towards socialism and abandon a lot of the philosophy that really made um, this great. Uh, but it's an interesting conflict that still kind of rages today that Emerson believed that women should be equal to men, but he believed that men should have their own men's clubs. And Higginson said, no, you have to allow the women into your men's clubs. So even today, I'm sure we're still faced with the question like, should the sexes have their own unique spaces? Or does everything have to be integrated? And that, that conversation still rages on. Here's another great transcendentalist that I can't skip by. Um, Brevet Major General Joshua Chamberlain. He was very famous for holding the line um, at Gettysburg. Um, uh, he was a transcendentalist and he was a professor of rhetoric. Uh, just amazing work. Um, uh, basically when the Medal of Honor God, you your continued service, service, or service to service even after he was significantly injured. Interesting thing about him, um, he was a professor at rhetoric, so he would have spent uh, most of his years um, deeply ingrained in the Greek and Latin literature. He would have been teaching a lot of the, the texts that we talked about in this presentation uh, to young men. And at that time period, 
um, history of the field would have been like 99% military history. So his his experience as an instructor would have uh, predisposed him to have a knowledge of tactics and fighting and ability and uh, would have made him a perfect military leader. And it's quite interesting because when the US military entered World War I, they asked the universities to shut down early. And the purpose was they wanted the professors for officers. Because at the time, the officers would have spoken many languages. They would have been used to essentially controlling young men. They would have read all these great works of military history. They would have known works of military philosophy. And you think today, like today, our universities are no longer the bastions or they don't hold the military knowledge that they used to in the past, which is quite tragic. Now, there's one interesting echo of neo-Stoicism that occurred at the very tail end of the 21st century or 20th century, which is uh, General Charles Krulak's The Strategic Corporal. And it was put into a theory called the Three Block War. And essentially, uh, it described a young Marine corporal that was walking through a city or taking his, his squad through a city. And essentially, he would encounter different levels of warfare in various different aspects. So he might have uh, whatever, a little, little engagement, like a police control engagement. He might walk into a, a block where there's a humanitarian aid, or he may walk into a block where there's low intensity warfare. But the idea was to form a junior leader, a very young soldier that would have been, well, young Marine, that would have been 19, 20 years old, that was fully capable of understanding his situations and then applying the right amount of force um, to the enemy. So obviously, if you're um, doing humanitarian aid, you can get attacked, you're going to use less force um, to resist than if you were in a block that was having an all-out gunfight. And the intent was to use the appropriate amount of force to control the situation and uh, basically win hearts and minds and uh, show the populace that you're working in, that you were kind of respectful um, and that you um, well, could control the situation by using the least amount of appropriate violence. Um, interesting aspects, uh, the, the theory itself was very much uh, virtue focused on the Marine Corps values, uh, dependent on uh, high quality military education, realistic training. They were given examples of great battlefield um, heroes or leaders to basically emulate. And then that, that whole format fully empowered mission commander trust among the Marines and that theory position the Marine Corps probably better than any of the other branches in the US military um, during the early years of the Iraq and Afghanistan war. So not directly connected with military stoicism, but just uh, the reference this uh, field. So modern stoicism is uh, basically a wave of stoicism that um, was essentially 20th century on virtue ethics uh, a lot of people would say it was uh, essentially started with Albert, Albert Alice, Aaron Beck using Stoic philosophy to um, help improve uh, psychology. Um, there is also a charity by the same name or nonprofit that includes most of the major authors that, uh, that are fairly well known, Chris Gillow, Don Robertson, and Greg Sadler, Ryan Holiday, uh, Massimo Pelligli, Pelligucci. Uh, the one thing I don't like about uh, the neo-Stoic or the modern Stoic tradition is they tend to um, always just reference back to ancient Stoicism and they don't necessarily uh, take into account some of the other evolutions of Stoicism. Um, and then just because of the nature of the, the military um, community, military members aren't academics. So academics tend to be um, very hyper focused on certain time periods. They like very precise definitions where soldiers um, have a tendency to recognize stoic traits that would be common with stoic philosophy and people that haven't been exposed to stoicism. And uh, we may name them as stoics. So um, uh, Jonathan Shea in Odyssey America mentions that Vietnam veterans that have been isolated by themselves um, have often developed essentially their own variation of Stoic philosophy without any education in themselves. Uh, Lester Tenney was a uh, taken prisoner in uh, World War II by the Japanese. He developed 
um, very much very similar tenets in terms of dichotomy of control to the Stoics. Um, Viktor Frankl, um, Jewish prisoner uh, by the Nazis, uh, developed uh, logotherapy very much in line with Stoic philosophy. Um, the military community isn't scared by naming these folks um, Stoics, which freaks out academic Stoics. Um, and I have a good friend, uh, Mike Barr. Uh, he's working on uh, an article about uh, Japanese culture and kind of uh, the relation between kind of Japanese warrior culture and the Stoic philosophy. Ultimately, and what I like to think about is the Stoic philosophy on the battlefield discovered underlying human truths about the battlefield. And soldiers tend to use the, the word stoicism as, a, as um, a synonym for truth. So if you discover that same reality through Japanese warrior culture or some other warrior culture, they're going to use the term um, stoic just because that, that makes the most sense to them to use versus some other phrase. So that leads me to here. So this is my best attempt uh, to define what military stoic is or what a military stoic is. Um, so it's essentially the philosophy of uh, Western um, tr or military tradition. It was informed by ancient stoicism, enhanced by neo-stoicism. Um, it supports diversity and includes an atheological approach. Um, key characteristics of modern stoics include love, trust, respect, good reputation, friendly persuasion, gentle procedure, justice, development of physical, mental, and spiritual qualities, and is virtue focused. And that list of characteristics actually refers um, to Gerard von Skarnhorst's treatment of uh, uh, his drafted soldiers, but fits very well. And then military stoicism also promotes freedom of action uh, within defined constraints or supports mission command. It's restrained by um, the laws of war and it has an emphasis on soldiers being self-reliant. Now the question is, why have we lost the direct connection with Stoic philosophy inside the military? And uh, this is one suggestion that I may have is the range of combat has changed. So if we look at kind of Roman warfare or Greek warfare, basically warfare occurred into whatever range that you could throw a spear or shoot an arrow. So a lot of times less than 30 meters. So a lot of, lot of training um, had to be put into philosophy and it wasn't always philosophy. So they depended heavily on um, theology as well. Whatever could get a man to stand in formation when he was staring with, you know, within feet or meters of the enemy was important during that time period. Um, however, with the, with the technology that we have today, a lot of our warfare ends before uh, what ancient warfare would begin at. And uh, it wouldn't be uncommon today to put a person on the battlefield and have them engage in active combat where they never actually see the enemy. So they're firing a weapon system that will travel several miles um, or just because of camouflage or other things. Um, so less, less focus was put on the actual philosophical matter. Um, and some of that may be connected with um, uh, Grossman's theory that the closer that you get to your enemy before you kill them, the larger the psychological burden will be on the soldier. So if you shoot a person at 100 meters, it's far less damaging if you have to stab a person at three feet. Um, so to some degree, the psychological impacts of warfare. It may have been slightly decreased by modern warfare. And then finally, the technical skills required of a soldier are kind of ever increasing. And uh, if you look at World War II, you had 16 weeks to take a drafted soldier, a drafted civilian, and make them into a soldier. So if you only had 16 weeks, you're focusing on getting them into shape, you know, teaching them how to use their weapon, teaching them how to do land navigation, you're dropping them into combat. You don't have time to, to talk about philosophy. And uh, what I think really supports this theory about the range, what, or range affecting whether or not there's a connection with philosophy is if you actually look at the the units inside the military that still have to engage in extreme close combat, uh, more than likely you're going to find people that know the Stoic philosophy still in those units. So the Marine Corps 
has a much greater connection to stoicism because they do more close combat. Or say if you go to the Army Rangers, you're more likely to find someone that knows what stoicism is or can explain it than if you went to a transportation company. The other major thing, probably the major thing, that has broken the direct connection or knowledge of the connection is a shift to secular humanism. And that occurred kind of in the really starting 1880s time periods in the, at least American education. And it's the, the attempt to essentially say that mankind doesn't need theology to act morally. And as a result, you see a lot of the stripping of education of, of materials that would have previously referenced some type of um, theology or historical text. Um, you also see the abandonment of ancient languages so we no longer teach our kids Latin or Greek, so they're not being exposed to these older um, archetypal stories. And uh, yeah, which it, it's really disappointing. You also see a kind of a growth of the belief that if you, if you didn't train the next generation to fight wars, then there wouldn't be a war after that, which there's actually indication that the opposite happens. And then you see a removal of the nightly education requirements, especially for young boys. So a young man's education was always believed the, the need to know ability to ride a horse or engage in warfare, to kind of do tough things, tough enough men, but that's almost all been removed. Um, when ROTC was, when I should step back, when the American land grant colleges were granted, there was a requirement that students be taught military tactics. And with the invention of the ROTC program in 1916, now people interpret that as, oh, you can go into the voluntary program to learn military tactics if you want to. But if you actually look at the original law written in whatever, 1862 or 1863, it's a universal standard. So, hey, if you want to go to college, part about going to college is learning how people fight. And to some degree, I would say that's one of the biggest downfalls of modern societies. As soon as you separate a civilian population from military knowledge, especially in a democracy, then they're not going to use their vote appropriately because they don't have the actual connection to understand the suffering or they don't have the fear of being personally responsible to be called to the front line. So it's the uh, consequences of the loss of exposure is, well, soldiers, aren't being exposed to all these materials developed over millennia that could help develop them um, in terms of developing and safeguarding their, their psychological health and improving their combat abilities. Uh, the U.S. Army has had tremendous problems having a, a single philosophy. Um, the behavior of soldiers has decreased. In the 1970s, the Army tried to uh, create Army values. Um, shared belief systems, but there is no underlying philosophy. And the problem with saying, hey, you need to be loyal is a person that's whatever, at the extreme, a Marxist would interpret loyalty different than a neo-Stoic and without the military taking a stand and saying, this is the exact philosophy we're going to use. Nothing that they pick out for values will ever stand. Um, and there's a big fear politically, and I understand it, of having a service pick out an underlying philosophy. Uh, we, tend, we, we tend to fail at trying to initiate mission command and using that higher order um, combat skill because we, we, we don't trust our soldiers. They're not virtue based. They're not operating in that society. When they come back to garrison, they don't get trained appropriately to use it when they're in peacetime, when they get dropped in the wartime. Uh, there's a lot of hesitancy, risk avoidance, all sorts of reasons that culturally we are not set up to fully support that. And then we have this terrible growth of the gap between the military and civilian community um, that we are seen as disconnected. So professional military isn't one that's connected to their, their communities. It's very easy to get in the long scale wars and not care as a private individual if your country's fighting a war or not. Um, there's not an understanding of the suffering or the, the experience of what a soldier has to go through if we have to go to war and we're not tempering our, our voting and our political process to understand the consequences of our vote. So the real question is the future of the past. Do we want our, our military leaders to have all these great characteristics? And really do we want our population to have all these um, great characteristics? And then ultimately we need to take the time uh, to go back and instruct our 
our soldiers and our citizens in this philosophy so we can do uh, what we need to do to be effective on the battlefield. So this is my suggestion for a way ahead. Um, so we need to um, build Stoic philosophy resiliency programs to reclaim the direct connection to the Stoic tradition. So that's why I fully support the BOSS program, just an amazing program. It's a great start and I continue to look forward to seeing the great connections that will continue to build upon. Um, military leaders need to talk about Stoic philosophy and to a large degree, we need to take a risk of supporting classical humanism. So we need to share those older archetypal stories and say, hey, you can read Virgil and not believe in the Roman pantheon. Like, hey, it's it's good for you to go back and read Robin Crusoe, but you don't have to be a Christian to understand the moral of the story. Um, we need to have some type of reading list um, for our soldiers that want to continue their their self-directed learning inside um, neo-Stoicism and uh, Stoic text. Um, and this is particularly important in terms of the connection inside the the military community. So as most of you know, resiliency programs are great, but they tend to wear off in time. And either they need some type of inoculation where soldiers have to repeat that resiliency training, or if you just give them a list of whatever hundreds of inspiring military history works that they can go back and see that philosophy play out by different periods of military history, they can essentially help inoculate themselves by this continual self-study of philosophy and military history. And then we need to make explicit stoic toughening training. So the military is really great at dragging soldiers and saying, hey, we need to go do a 12 mile wreck march. This is how much weight you need to go. It's gonna be a miserable experience, but we don't take the time to be like, hey, this is more than just physical fitness. This is getting you to be uncomfortable and teaching you how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Or, hey, we're taking you out in the extremes of the weather because when you get into combat, we need you to focus on the enemy and not how cold or how wet you are. We want you to get comfortable and used to these type of stimuli so they're not distracting you from what could kill you. And then outside the military, once again, um, to continue to develop those stoic resiliency programs. Um, I think the veteran community can do wonders by sharing stoic philosophy in terms of uh, recovery from PTSD or how they use it post their military transition. And once again, I encourage that stoic toughening training. So go out, um, and engage in that stoic toughening training uh, to increase your kind of mental resilience and your hardiness. So I want to leave you with this last quote. Um, it's a great quote by um, Joshua Chamberlain referring to the Battle of Gettysburg. So in great deeds, something abides. On great battlefields, something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear, but spirits linger. They consecrate ground for the vision place of souls, generations that know us not and that we know not of, hearts drawn to see where and by who great things were suffered and done for them, shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream, and lo, the shadow of the mighty presence shall wrap them in their bosom, and the powers of the visions pass into their souls. So why I was not able to take you to a battlefield today. Hopefully I was able to show you some of the connections between the military and Stoic philosophy to help inspire you to go out and do some self-study by yourself. So with that, thank you. I have a question. Sure. If you had your way, which iteration of Stoicism would you like to see the the modern military embrace, or do you think it's important for for them to be educated in the whole evolution of Stoicism, and they can develop their kind of their own their own philosophy that fits? So I'm an Emersonian idealist personally, so I'm I'm going to be biased towards that. But I, I do believe that kind of the whole evolution is important because really, if you go back to kind of the birthplace of Stoicism and how it directly connects to democracy and then understanding how our political systems correlate with that philosophical military tradition is important. So um, I think Emersonian idealist, um, idealism fits in best with the kind of connection to modern diversity and kind of the broadness of our culture and captures a lot of the great Stoic traditions, but I, I would not, I think that's probably the easiest one because it's also atheological to introduce, but I don't think that I wouldn't prohibit it. I would want them to know kind of the faces of the evolution.
Brandy has a question. Hello, yes, thank you for this wonderful lecture. I was just wondering if you could speak a little more about the tension between the stoic focus on individualism and being self-reliant versus the collective culture that we need in the military to rely on your teammates. Is this just a bigger conception of what I am as an individual, as in I'm part of a team, or what, how does that, how's that going to shake out? Yeah. So this is an interesting question. So like what the, what the limits of, of uh, individualism is. Um, so Carl von Clausewitz actually said that the two greatest virtues of a soldier is courage and self-reliance. So if you're not actively attacking the enemy, then you're improving your situation. So I think to some degree, it's, it's you taking whatever capability you have to improve the situation around you. And that's ultimately going to impact your team and some of that self-reliance when you use the word self is really the unit practicing self-reliance as a unit and not necessarily as an individual member. Um, and I, the, the term individualism is hard to use because it, it carries so much kind of baggage because people use it in different ways, in different contexts that can conflict with themselves. But I think a lot of what we think of as stoic individualism is just taking personal responsibility. So it's not like my sergeant didn't tell me to dig a hole, it's me realizing I got to a place where a hole needs to be dug and I just do it by myself. Other questions, comments, concerns, death threats? <laughs> <laughs> well, these concepts apply. I mean, we're talking about military philosophy and, and the current current realm of what you research. I'm assuming, or I'm going to make an assumption that because of the paramilitary structure within first responder groups as a whole, that there's a translatability. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about that, given your background as a you know in pre hospital care? Yeah. What you've experienced. I'm trying to think. Um, so I think Stoicism, like the, obviously the ancient Stoicism, and the, the idea of the cosmo, cosmos very easily translates in terms of um, just individuals wanting to go out and help their community or you, you break down those barriers, right? I'm going to go out and risk my life to, to save someone so I can treat them as equal to me. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's not obviously connected in the same political structures where you have with the military, where there's a distinctive shaping of society. Um, but obviously there's that great kind of, whether it's the ancient Stoic cosmopolitan to the, the neo-Stoic kind of just love and generosity to your fellow man connection. But um, obviously the order and kind of discipline or um, being subservient to a larger goal obviously would would carry very well or easily translate. I had a question. There was one part earlier in your presentation where you had a list of kind of um, stoic ideals, and there was one, I think it was the fourth, that talked about acknowledging the emotional response, but the focus on the use of logic to drive a virtue based action. Yes. And so, um, in the field of psychology, as you likely are aware, you know, we're always trying to get people to connect uh, that emotional side with the logical side and really value the emotional component, the experience. And um, how, how does that fit into, like maybe, maybe I'm a little bit confused about that. Could you explain how that principle kind of works and what that yes. actually means? So the, the greatest example I have is so, and I can't remember the exact reference, so very very famous Stoic has to take a, a sea voyage back in ancient Stoicism, back when it was really dangerous to travel by sea. Huge storm comes up, this guy's absolutely terrified, like everyone knows that he's like this great Stoic stage or sage, and then everyone on the crew realizes that he's absolutely terrified. And uh, at the end of the voyage, they ask him, like, well, if you're a great stoic, then why were you scared? And it was like, well, it was just my human natural reaction to be scared. But what he was focused on in that moment, even though it was it was him accepting kind of the dichotomy of control, it's perfectly acceptable for me to be scared. But what's my rational action? Like, is my fear right now going to make me better or worse? Like, it's something that I feel I can emotionally process. But if I dwell on my fear, like, it's not going to 
my fear isn't going to sink the ship and my fear isn't going to keep the ship afloat. So it's like, what can I rationally do in that moment that make my situation better? So it's not the uh, suppress my fear. It's just something that's there and something that you deal with. Why do you think it's important to um, provide the education from an atheological framework? So personally, I don't. But I would say that it's also temperamental, right? So if I have, this comes from kind of the American Republic tradition, right? So as a, as a governmental agency, I can't establish an official religion under the First Amendment. So I could say, hey, this is the classical story with theology. Here's the non-classical story without theology. And, you know, take your pick type of situation. It's kind of a bad joke that there's no atheists in foxholes, but there are. But I've never met a man in a foxhole not looking for meaning. So it's like, I'm going to find a way to help you get the meaning that you're chasing after. But it doesn't have to be the road I walk, personally. Mm -hmm. So Then, well, yeah, that and the kind of the larger exclusion. I also don't, I would hate to see, like, people perceive themselves as being outcasts or not being able to access this because they come from some kind, some other cultural tradition. I have, a, <laughs> um, yeah, I have lots of questions. Um, this will be my last one though. Um, you know, like you, you mentioned that different authors present stoicism, like, Lucy Montgomery, for example, was she a self-proclaimed transcendentalist or did somebody just read her story and they're like, hey, this looks like transcendentalism. Let's analyze it from that perspective. Or, or did she actually explicitly espouse that philosophy? Um, I, I believe I would have to go. So that's the one author that I'm weakest at. Um, I, I'm assuming that she was a self-professed transcendentalist. She actually wrote that first book like in the heart of where transcendentalism was founded. So she was in Massachusetts in the heart of of the birthplace of transcendentalism when she wrote that novel. So it would be it would be just the connections in there would be unmistakable to put so much connections in that just be kind of an accident that someone read into later. So uh, so I'm wondering from your perspective, what are some of the biggest misconceptions relative to stoicism and how that fits today? Biggest misconception Ah, uh, well, the, you could pick out the, like, the classic archetypes. So like the, the biggest ones that get thrown out there is like, oh, it's the philosophy of old dead white men often comes up, right? And then you're like, well, there's a tremendous amount of diversity inside um, Stoicism himself. And then you could even go back to like Zeno Ocidium was like Phoenician. So he wasn't really like what we consider white um, to begin with. So um, I think there's a big um big disconnection and it's probably because the way we teach education today is so freaking boring um it's been, like how many people have taken a philosophy class in college how many people like, like how many philosophy majors in here right <laughs> like no one majored in philosophy because it's really it's really like grinding your teeth boring in class where like no one's pulling out these larger adventure stories. So I think when people hear like stoicism or philosophy that they get immediately turned off because that was the that was the super boring subject that they just want, want to get into. Or we try to we try to convey stoicism at first by using kind of the straight philosophy instead of saying, hey, check out the Martian. Hey, did you enjoy the movie? Now I'm going to explain how there's stoicism throughout this movie, and then then we can start talking about the actual philosophy or how to apply it. So it's, which I guess comes down to anything. It's like, well, Xenophon says, right? When the when the teacher isn't pleasing, then no student wants to learn. So it's like, how are you introduced? How passionate is in your instructor? You know, do you have faith in your instructor? And that might be my objection to a lot of modern Stoics in terms of working in the the realm of military stoicism is a, is a significant number of the modern Stoics have no connection to the military. So when they talk about military, it's like, well, you have no expertise in it, or you don't know how, you don't have the passion for it because you don't understand it as a profession, and that connection just doesn't carry. So, you know, it's not that they're, you know, a lot of times they have a lot of great works to share, but it's it's not coming from the right person to carry to the right audience. 
in a lot of ways, you know, you can have a lot rougher forms of, a lot of uncivilized forms of stoicism carry farther through a combat that, that applied a rough version versus a, a very polished academic trying to teach someone something. Can I ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> I'm here all day. <laughs> um, so we, see, we hear lots of themes uh, when we work with veterans or when we work with uh, police officers or people that uh, work for the fire department or, what, or so on around sanctuary trauma and moral injury. And so what do you think is missing from their learning or or what, what, what might we be able to augment to their learning around Stoic philosophy that would help bridge that or help minimize that? Because it, it comes up as a frequent theme. I hope that so makes sense. So what I can say from my kind of personal experience with the Iraq War and the difficulty I had there was came back home just because of my own personal love of audiobooks. I was working at Home Depot stocking stuff on the shelves and I was listening to all the free audiobooks that you can find on LibriVox.org. Great, great resource. So I was introduced by the Klautswitz long before anyone in the Army told me to listen to it. But Klautswitz actually goes through a dialectic of what is war. And he says it's somewhere between a brawl, a fist fight, and politics by other means. But as he goes through that argument, you quickly realize that there's, there's no virtue in war. Like war is the fault of nations that get thrown into war with each other. And I think a lot of the kind of the moral issues that we face as soldiers is maybe we sold war to young men as something to be morally correct. Like, hey, you're there, you're going there for some greater moral good instead of saying you're going there because politicians failed and we couldn't find a peaceful resolution, but you're there because we don't have any other way of doing it. So you're, la you're, la you're our last safeguard to defend citizens, but you are being thrown into the worst place that you'll ever experience like you'll be presented with options where you know you're picking between two great evils and there's no good solution so i think if soldiers knew walking in that they'd be facing situations where they were never given the correct option that'd be a lot easier on the backside where you i think as a whether a novice non-veteran you walk in thinking that hey i can i can fight within the laws of war or, there is like a left and right boundary that doesn't really exist in real life. And you can read the ancient Stoics because whatever, Scipio Africanus was brutal compared to what we have in our modern war. So like there's a story in Scipio Africanus where essentially one village said, hey, we'll swear loyalty. Um, to stop fighting and a truce, so they were allowed to stop fighting and then whatever, later on in the war, they went back to the side of Hannibal. So the punishment was essentially to exterminate the village the next time it went through. But it was like, well, you know, you're given that one chance to virtue and then, then it's gone. But so war itself can be incredibly brutal. Does anyone online have any questions? Oh, Dr. Andrew? Yeah, just uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, awesome. Um, hey, Franklin. Um, the one of the things we I often run into um, is this one of the misconceptions of stoicism is that the colloquial way that we use to be stoic is to be sort of numb and and you know flat affect and and unfeeling. Um, and and so much of of the from from the science background of of psychological wellness is is counteracting what is you know sometimes we term it you know experiential avoidance you know that suppression that avoidance and and so I'm, and I'm just running by this this idea by you to see how what you think of it um, you know th that kind of the the real non-colloquial stoic approach there is really this emphasis on full acceptance like acceptance of you know as a human being you're going to have reactions you're going to have emotions you're going to have thoughts uh that you know are painful or undesirable and that in fact part of part of a healthy approach to that is is finding the opportunity and taking the opportunity to accept and experience 
those yes. as completely as possible. Is that is that pretty accurate? You think? Yes, and I would I would and this kind of comes with like the shift in education too because like this idea of this emotionalist man is really so it was born out of kind of mid nineteenth century. But I think if you can connect back to more of the historical text, you have a lot more free discussion of emotion though. So like whatever, whether it's George Washington crying when he's leaving the service, like, you know, the archetype of the perfect American man, like weeping when he's leaving the service or uh, kind of my area of study, Captain Alden Partridge has the cadet die when he was at training and he basically addresses his troops and say the not weep at this point would be the damage your own soul. So it's, I, I think it's a pulling a lot more of the, the tradition out to say, hey, we're going to experience this, or even to some degree, like we're going to experience this as a team. And then if we need to, we can get into the conversation of saying, well, if you're heading out to battle, you can say, hey, we'll acknowledge the fact that some of us may get hurt or some of us get wounded, but we, we, we're not allowed to mourn until you know, we're back at this base and then we'll we'll cry until we can't cry anymore. And uh, but there's that that obviously that need to have and process that that emotional, physiological process. And could I ask a follow up question then? Sure. From the, the stoic perspective, what do you what what's the understanding of. Of uh, not just the history. The historical story of how this, you know, numb, disconnected, emotionless figure developed, but but how do we explain why that gets taught so often? Like, how is it that that is seen as virtuous and and other approaches to life? Well, I, I think that and this gets into a lot of politics, but I think that kind of when with second and third wave feminism, we haven't figured out the relations between the genders. So kind of like Emerson talking about males needing kind of their own clubs. Like I think that there's a difference between the sexes and how they process emotion and what was maybe protected from public view in the past for men has either disappeared or the place in society has ultimately shifted to the point where we don't know the relationship between things. So. If we went back to like the 1940s, it's pretty under, easy to understand kind of what the what the purpose of a man was or a husband or what you were supposed to do in society. But if I asked, you know, a boy growing up right now, like what is your archetypal story for how you're a successful male in the 21st century? I don't think anyone can really tell that. Like, is it getting married? Maybe is it, you know, are you the primary breadwinner? Maybe it's just not not there. Like even this understanding of like what emotions are you supposed to show like to what degree how are you supposed to interact with other men how are you supposed to interact with other women i think that's all dramatically been thrown into chaos but no one's really tried to reassemble it or or you know we're not willing to say hey we made mistakes along the way so we're going to reestablish some type of hero narrative for young boys to follow so i think that they get sucked into whatever or these stereotypes, whether it's, you know, these movies that, and this is the interesting conversation I think I had with Sheridan, like, if I told you what neo-Stoics did and how they acted, and then you watched a John Wayne movie, you can very easily see when John Wayne gets emotional and why he does what he does. But if I don't tell you the philosophy of why John Wayne's acting like a certain character in Hondo, then you perceive him as totally emotionalist and you know, you see these very shallow expressions of masculinity because no one explained how that character got to where he is or what he's thinking to himself. And I think that when we removed kind of that instruction in society, little boys got these really narrow kind of emotionalist views of masculinity that keep haunting us. And we, we yeah, it, and I think that also ties into like how we even approach the treatment of the psychology of men like if, if you have a veteran that's like lost everything and that's totally depressed and nothing like the he's a male like the primary focus should be like making him feel confidence and power not necessarily making him feel acceptance for himself because his natural discomfort is fine 
the feel as kind of a masculine man. Like you have to have some type of respect or some type of way to move forward. Then it's not necessarily patting you on the back saying, oh, you're okay as you are. It's like some, some, some hero's story or journey, some way to improve themselves. And uh, I don't think we've necessarily done a good job at keeping psychology kind of split or oriented towards the, the different sexes in terms of what they actually need for the different sexes. I appreciate your thoughts. Which I'd love to get the counter thought from that from psychologists. <laughs> you know, are you with that one? Uh, it's, it's interesting. It is an interesting idea. And, and the way that uh, because there's so much uh, combination of, uh, of the sexes, you know, with regards to working roles, it, it, it does create it is interesting, you know, because we have way more females within fire departments, within EMS, and so some of those traditional archetypes that have historically been for men are now kind of shifting, and, and lots of the women that we see that are injured, they're they're trying to replicate uh, those those things that males have traditionally espoused. So it is it is an interesting idea. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, and this is where like ideologies like can be laid on without understanding of physiology too. Like, so the tear ducts of a man were considerably larger than the tear ducts for women. So, like, a man and a woman can experience the same kind of trauma, and the woman's going to cry first because she doesn't have the capacity to hold tears like the way a man does. So, when we ask men to cry as much as women, we're actually asking them to cry significantly more than women. So, if, you know, just the structure of the face and that type of thing is taken into yeah, in general, regards. Man, more emotional creatures. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, wow. Well, depends on what emotion. Frank, in your opinion, because stoicism is a foundation, foundational piece of thought. Um, should there be a balanced approach towards educating stoicism amongst leadership and frontline, or a more focused approach on one or the other? Because to Lawrence's point earlier, some of those pieces around um, organizational traumas or sanctuary traumas is because of a lack of understanding of, of the yeah. leadership perspective. So ultimately, so I'd love to say balance, but all, I would be biased towards training more towards leadership because even if you look at the the studies, if I if I drop soldiers into combat and I drop them into combat with more of a, sto a truly stoic lieutenant, that population is going to experience less traumatic stress, whether or not they know stoicism or not, because of the behaviors of the leader. So the leader is a much more important target. And then even if we talk, so to be realistic about stoicism in military history, like there was never a period in the Roman army where every soldier was stoic. It was always a minority. So it was probably just the officers that really embraced stoicism. Um, there was, uh, there, most of the, sto or the soldiers in the Roman empire would have been using more theological um, belief systems to deal with combat than actual philosophy. So I don't think that I would love it that if we could universally teach stoicism, but I think that certain people just because of their temperament are going to reject that. But leaders would be the primary primary place to invest limited resources. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, throw on out. I don't, I don't know if this makes sense because I have a really limited knowledge and understanding of stoicism, of philosophy in general. But when we're looking at the physiology of the nervous system and trauma and all of that stuff, is stoicism a reaction to prolonged nervous system activation? In terms of like when you're looking at toughening education or like putting people in these hardship type situations and so that they can learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. Is that not 
having a nervous system activation response for a prolonged period of time and expecting habituation? So yes. So with my current book, I'm trying to actually define. Okay, so so as a hobby, if anyone doesn't know, I, I engage in long range ruck marking. That's kind of my stoic toughness training. So I'm trying to cap copy the practices of Al Al Alden Partridge. I'm not there yet. Like I can march 62 miles in a day. That's probably the farthest I've ever gone. Miles? Yeah. Miles, miles. So 100 clicks in a day. Um, <laughs> but so we we come so we we have a there's a dual mode theory. So your brain once you hit over 80 percent of your maximal heart rate, your brain will start shutting down the blood supply to your cognitive ability centers of your brain, and they will do that well mainly as a safeguard because your body is trying to keep you from killing yourself with activity. And one of the experiments I'm trying to do is like, how close can I walk close to that 80%, but then engage in whatever stoic meditations. So like focus on gratitude and positive memories and all sorts of things. Can you reshape how you, how far you can go by controlling your thoughts and your emotions at that, that cusp, mm -hmm. but. How's that going? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, well, I, so I can tell you that like when I first started the, my, my, my journey, like I really struggled to hit 50 miles marching in a day. And there's, I go out kind of once a quarter, maybe even once a month if I have the time. But like I would find myself hitting like 36 miles. Self talk, right? It's like every voice inside your head, every reason why you could quit, and no one would care about. Like, no one else goes out and marches 40 miles in a day. Like, hey, my feet are sore. Hey, I should be like playing with the kids, or like, hey, well, you know, whatever. Maybe maybe my back's a little sore. I don't want to like strain myself and I won't be able to come out again. Like, there's every little voice of doubt that comes out inside your brain that tells you just to stop. And when I started at that point, really focusing on like focusing, I have a series of questions I keep in, I'm writing in a book that I really started focusing on. That's when I really realized at that point, I really could march indefinitely as long as I could keep myself focused on certain thoughts and ideas and not kind of that, that background negativity. Mm -hmm. So it's that optimism that can override some of the controls. But, Yes, I would agree with you that some of stoicism is the nature of warfare will push people to that edge and beyond it. And that's also the reasons why I think stoicism, when we teach it, has to have that element of redemption and forgiveness. Because like if I push a guy really into close combat when they're running 90 percent heart rates and they have 15 minutes of close combat, like they've lost their ability to be to be moral. Really, like I can't determine whether or not it's the right time to pull the trigger or not. So if you pop up in front of me, you're getting shot because like I, I've just physically exceeded my, my mental capacity. So when they come back down and they get the oxygen back to their brain, like I have to have a way to them to forgive themselves and get back into that more stoic process. Um, but a lot of it's training them to understand what's going to happen to their thought processes at that extreme end and how to how to negotiate their physical actions so they can try to stay kind of under that 80 percent where they can still think and be moral in their actions so. yes what role does like an individual's environment play in just like prolonged exposure to trauma, like does like does that sense of optimism work best when they're in like a war zone or is it once back home and you're out of the To some degree I'd say it, it works best when you're back home. This is an interesting question. If you're in combat, there's no such thing as PTSD. Because the best soldiers will have PTSD because they're the only ones that will survive. Because they're the guys that will repetitively clean their weapons. That they will start at any sound. They are the most alert, most oriented. It's pure survival. So that is that's truly optimized. So the question is, when you drop them back home, like how do they 
shed some of that. And, uh, and it's always an awkward question for soldiers that have to remain in the profession because it's like, how do you give up the skills that saved your life and that you may have to apply again? So how, how do I put this down and then still pick it back up? Um, um, but obviously, and this also goes back to the leadership question, it's the leaders that are really key of maintaining that kind of positive positive framing of the reality of warfare that will really safeguard the psychological health of soldiers while they're there. So if they understand the purpose and they have hope, no matter how bad things get, then things will go well. But if they lose trust in their fellow soldiers and they, they're not hopeful of a positive outcome, that's when things go really wrong. So. Great question. Though. Okay, sounds like a wrap. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.